All right, welcome, Trogonomics, season one, episode six. We've got a great conversation here today, and I'm excited to speak to Dr. Trogden about another topic that we've talked personally about, but also that I think is very relevant as parents and as individuals chasing our own careers and dreams. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about the decision-making process that an economist takes with something as emotional as chasing your dreams. Um, so I'll set it up a little bit. We had a family day out recently. We went to a minor league baseball. There's an A team in our, in our community. We went to go see them and having one of those great Saturday afternoons with the kids, the sun's out, the, the hot dogs are plentiful, the game is going great. You see all these young players um, out there uh, doing something pretty cool, getting paid to play baseball. And my, my vision drifts to the outfield wall where I see the murals and names of every player from this team that's ever made it to the major leagues. And it was eight players, <laughs> uh, which, which hit me a little hard as, uh, as somebody who's raising kids, as somebody who, who chases his own dreams at times, uh, successfully and unsuccessfully statistically, I started thinking, wow, A, there's a lot of players on the field right now. B, this team's been around about six years. Um, so eight players have come through and made it to the majors. So I, I started thinking a little bit about the um, decision-making process, uh, maybe times where I've gone too emotional with my path and not uh, not uh, sound enough with my decision making or sensible enough I haven't had those out-of-body experiences where I've said to myself Brett maybe you shouldn't have done this maybe you should do this instead um, so talk to me a little bit about this scenario as an economist um, you're 20 some years old you're a gifted athlete or gifted in a particular field you have an opportunity to enter at the uh, bottom level of a career path um, talk to me a little bit about this, this moment in time, Trog, and, and how that relates um, to your field of expertise. Yeah, um, well, maybe surprising or maybe not so surprising for those of you that um, like to keep up with popular economists, but this is a thing that economists have talked about. Um, we, we like to talk about lots of stuff beyond just, you know, money and finance. So um, I think the there's two kind of key principles in the way that, that I would approach this, you know, using sort of economic tools. Um, the first comes up in like almost any decision you'd ever make. Um, so again, here we're thinking about someone who is thinking about a kind of risky career, right? One with potentially huge payoffs, but not a lot of people make it through versus something that's, you know, a little more known, stable, but, but doesn't have yeah. the huge windfall. So the first thing in any decision that, that I think about as an economist is, you know, you need to identify like what's the trade-off. So what are the benefits and what are the costs? So for that minor league player, right, the benefit is that the, every year they keep at it, the scout might see them, they might have a great year, and they might have a great game in front of the scout, and there's this big payoff of a major league contract that, that's coming. Right. So that's, that's the benefit. But there are costs, and, you know, those costs are, you know, mostly opportunity costs. They, Base, minor league players don't make a lot of money. A lot of them have been to college these days. So, you know, they could be working as an accountant or they could be, you know, working with a buddy, starting up their own company, doing something else. And so those, and that, those earnings are kind of real things that they're giving up. And so those are like kind of in this example, that would be like the benefits and the costs that you'd want to focus on. Yeah. How do you think about, whether it's minor league baseball to major leagues or, um, being a musician or being an artist or being um, maybe being an entry-level employee at a big company like you know a publicly traded fortune 500 company where if you can make it out of the the early stages of your career you start getting stock options you start getting bigger salaries you could go from working on a retail sales floor as a manager or assistant manager making, you know, a, an hourly wage to being a, an executive director of merchandising of, of retail operations or something like that, where you might be making, you know, two, three, four hundred thousand $400,000 a year, depending on your scale of work and things like that. So 
in the minor league case, you made a great example of like, if you do break through to the majors, minimum wage is about half a million dollars a year. So if you make that 40 man roster and, and even that 26 man roster of major league team, that's a good chunk of change. That's a real good salary at a young age. Um, we're looking at people in their 20s, early 30s, maybe. Um, and something where you can kind of set a financial platform for yourself. Um, but conversely, to your point, minor league baseball, you're making a couple hundred bucks a game. Um, what? Talk to me a little bit about that. You know, how do you look at that disparity between those two examples? How do you uh, mitigate the emotional uh, aspiration to a to an amount that makes good sense in your process? Yeah, so um, I think in general, you know, humans aren't that good at thinking about these big numbers when small probabilities, right? So there's lots of psychological research that says that we don't really handle either one of those very well. Like as soon as you start talking about numbers with a lot of commas on them, people don't really have a sense of what that means. Or as yeah. soon as you are talking about probabilities, sometimes at all, but especially like small probabilities, people often don't quite understand what that means either. And so these are, these are careers where, um, you know, well, one of the reasons they don't pay, you know, these entry level positions and minor league players is that they know that part of the, the benefit comes later, right? And that some yeah. people are going to be willing to take less now in order to, in order to hit that, that big shot later. Um, but as someone in one of those positions, I think it does pay to be as, you know, realistic, as rational as you can be about what the true, what the true payoffs are. And that actually brings like kind of the second, the second kind of key economic concept when it comes to decision making is, you know, like I said, any decision you're making, you need to think about what's the cost and benefits of your next decision point. Like, do I sign this contract for the next season? Yeah. What's the additional gain? What's the additional cost? But this, this example in particular is tricky because there's a lot of uncertainty. So we don't know, the baseball player doesn't know that their effort is definitely going to trans, you know, transition into a major league contract. There's a lot of randomness. There's a lot of stuff that's out of their control. Yeah. The entry level person at the, you know, Fortune 500 company, like they're, you know, obviously hard work and putting the time in and educating yourself you are going to increase your chances of making it through to that C-suite level job. But clearly not everyone that works hard and that gets a degree makes it there, right? So there's some right. randomness. And, and that making decisions when you don't know what the, what the future holds adds a whole nother wrinkle to this. Um, and so this, this uncertainty is a big thing we have to think about. And the tool that we use is um, what we call an expected value. So we think about what are all the things that could happen if I sign that contract this year? What are the, all the things that could happen if I don't think about what the chances of each of those things are, and then think about the value assigned to those. So let's just do real simple minor league player, right? They may, they've played a couple of years. They're thinking about, do I want to do this again next year? If they sign that contract, we can boil it down to like, let's just do two simple outcomes, right? One, they play all the years in the minors and they never get the call up Two, the other outcome is they get the call up to the majors. Right. And Next step is what are the probabilities of those things, right? So how likely is it do I think that I get that call up? And it's probably not that likely. I, we were, I was doing a little research for this and I saw one estimate that maybe 10% of all minor league players ever make it to the majors. You know, you were, you were kind of doing that math at the game yourself with eight out of however many people. Yeah, yeah. I mean, a minor league roster uh, at a given time is 30, 33, 35 players. A um, couple of seasons in the bag, maybe a little bit of turnover. Eight out of potentially 1,000. Right. Right? That's less than 1% in some cases. Now, to your point, you know, the, the, those variables are very editable um, and very subjective. So you may see somewhere in that kind of five to 10% range, but making uh, a five to 10% chance of making the majors means there's a 90% chance that you don't. That, that you, yeah, you that's know. right. <laughs> and not only is there a 90% chance that you don't make it, I would argue that the years of your life at 22 to 32 are uh, a great time to fail forward, not to fail backwards. 
uh, in the in the game of life and the career paths and in in your journey to you know adulthood and and things like that. Um, obviously, that's a bit of a dramatic. You know, the the minor league baseball. To your point, there's a lot of things out of your control. Let's say you're a catcher. How many catchers are in the major leagues right now? Two per team. Right. Uh, how many catchers are uh, so good that they're going to play for 10 years, right? Uh, how, I mean, the catcher is your captain on the field. It's, it's calling balls and strikes. It's knowing every detail of every player on every team that they face. So it, if you're in an organization where there's a great catcher at the top, that reduces your ability, and that has nothing to do with how good you are. That also goes back to the Fortune 500 company. If you're in a particular linear path and the director or the senior manager or whatever above you is so good and so comfortable at that spot, you're going to have to find a way to get around that. How, yeah. do, you, how do you calculate some of those unknowns and, and how do you think about that uh, in, in a way that might push you in one direction or the other? Yeah, yeah. So I think Again, the key concept here is you're going to have to, and it's squishy, right? It's a word we've used before, yeah. but even if you, even if you can bracket a range, um, think seriously about, you know, what you think your odds are making it. And then what do you think the value of hitting those things are? So we've talked about kind of minimum level salaries. If I basically spend the next season totally in the minors versus a minimum level salary, that's, you know, at least probably 20 X that if I make it to the majors that year. Um, and you can, if when you work that out, you can kind of come up with a number and say, well, kind of in expectation, right? I don't know what's going to happen this year, but kind of on average, I would expect, you know, basically to make X number of dollars. I did some back of the envelope math with some of these numbers that have been thrown around and I think a minor league player with a, a average chance of making, like we've been talking about it, you know, it's probably somewhere in the 30 to $40,000 a year salary range that they could expect to make. Now that, Again, taking into account those times when they make it in to the majors. Um, right. But that at least gives you like a starting, a starting position to think about where you're at currently. Um, the, the tricky part about this is the other thing that makes this decision harder right, is it's dynamic, right? It, it flows over time. In other words, right. you don't know what the future looks like and you have to kind of stay in it to get those draws over time, right? So in probability speak, like we talk about, you know, each – each season, you know, you would get a draw from like a, an urn of ping pong balls or something, right? Did I make it or not? And you have to put some time in in order to realize these things. And so there's a, there's a class of problems that economists and mathematicians have talked about that have this feature. Um, and I thought maybe we could, we could put the minor league down for a little bit and I'll do a potentially yeah. even simpler example just to give you a flavor of like what these, these class of models have. So it has names in the literature. I think uh, sort of the modern day version of this is, you know, let's say you're a single person, you're, you're out there trying to look for a good match for a partner, you're on the dating app, and you're basically deciding like, you know, I'm going on dates, I'm going on dates. When do I decide, yep, this person's good, I'm, I'm coming off, you know, I'm stopping my search, I'm coming off the dating app. Like, how do we, you know, how would you even think about that, right? So again, the, the benefits of the search are that I meet more people, right? I learn about yep. the pool of people that are out there. And there's always that chance that the next person is my good is my perfect match. And right, and that's what I'm looking for. But the cost is that, especially in dating, right, usually like the people that you pass up, you don't get a second chance to go back to, right? Or as you were yep. saying, like, you've got your 20s once, right. you don't really get a chance to go back and, you know, have the energy and the youthfulness and the, you know, all of you can't do that part again. So there is a cost to staying on the app, if you will, right, and continuing to look. And at some point, you may have, your best match may have been, you know, three dates ago, <laughs> three months ago, three years ago. You may have missed that. And you that may have window, missed it. That best opportunity window, you may have passed on the way to what you emotionally believe to be a better opportunity that you haven't yet come across. Right, right. So, you know, there's, there's this option value of keeping going, but there's also this chance that you may have, you may have already missed, you know, missed your chance. So what the, when, when mathematicians actually put some numbers on this, um, what they find is that there's, the, the rule is go out there, 
date a little bit, you know, get, get some data on what kind of people you're seeing. Do that for only so long. And at some point, what you're going to do is you're going to say, okay, I've, here's my sample I've drawn. I've dated this many people. I'm going to, from here on out, if I ever date someone that was a better match than anybody I've seen before, that's it. I'm done. And that's my, that's going to be my person. And it turns out that let's say you had, let's say you were planning on going over on a hundred dates and then, you know, so like, I really want to be, you know, want to be settled down by the time I'm 30. Um, I've got time and energy to do about a hundred dates. The math would say, do have about 35, six dates and then get a sense of like who your best match was. Mm -hmm. And then after that, the, anybody that you date that you think is better than anyone you've seen before you, you stop with them. And that balances so, the, the two trade-offs that we were talking about. And when we, when you use the term date, you're speaking individual, not instance of a date. Yes. Sorry. Uh, yeah. yeah. Try someone out so as a match. Right. Experiment right. with, let's say a hundred date, a hundred individuals. When you hit about a third of that, sit back and have a reassessment. So let's bring it back to the baseball analogy. Let's say I'm 22. I just got out of college. I got drafted. They sent me to an A team in the minor leagues. And I see that, uh, that salary with, uh, no commas in it, just a period. <laughs> and I see uh, a long path in front of me, but I believe that I am the right person for this major league job. So I sit down and I say, maybe there's a year, maybe two years, maybe it's a, a, a summer season, play some winter ball uh, in another market, something like that. Then I stop, I reassess, how did I do? Did I make progress? Did I get promoted to another division? Did I go from, um, you know, starting once a week to starting three days a week or something like that? And then think again, like, okay, here I am. What's the next step? Do I make it up to AAA? Do I make it up to, do I get invited to spring training? And then I give myself a couple years or a year to do something like that. Yeah, no, I think that's exactly right. I mean, I think if you take, take the other extreme, right? So I think most people would realize if you're, in, if you're in that position and you say, you know what, I'm going to give it one season and it's make or break, one season, I'm done. I think most people would have an intuition that like, well, you're not really giving yourself enough chance to improve, to make an impression, to meet the right, you know, the right managers, yeah. whatever to it is. To learn from your experiences. Right, right. And so I think evolve. everyone has that sense of like, you don't marry the per first person you date. You don't, you know, you don't take it one year and say, that's it, I'm done after that, right? You don't go join your first band and if it breaks up right. say well i'm never gonna do this again right um but on the other hand right you also you know if you've seen the movie bull durham right like kevin costner's character is this career minor leaguer right and like right. people kind of feel sorry for him at some points in the movie right it's like well, absolutely you know. um and so we're trying to find that where that balance is where you know it's it may be worth going one more season i think of the way you described it, it's really good right like get a few years under your belt give everybody a chance, you know, get, give yourself a chance to make it. But at some point, maybe you just make the decision. Okay, well, look, I'm going to one more season and I have to see, I have to see some sort of improvement, right? My, my expected value of this trade-off has to go up or I'm out, right? So either, like you said, either, you know, I, I get, maybe I make a minor league all-star team or maybe yeah. it's just a, maybe it's just a personal record and at batting average or slugging percentage or, you know, whatever, you know, but you'd have to, you'd probably want to put some sort of, I think in, in advance, I, I would put some sort of like line in the sand and say like, this is the quality improvement that I'm looking for, or I probably need to go in a different direction. And being open to a constantly reassessing, reevaluating those lines in the sand and B having the courage to walk away. Right. Right. I mean, another, you know, another thing that um, when we talked about is assessing and I think part of the reason that it's important when the, in this job scenario we're talking about. So unlike my dating app scenario where, you know, you're basically every person you meet is kind of just a random draw from the app and you may or may not right. like that person. With, in other words, sort of the cost of search is pretty constant and, you know, the, the benefit is also pretty constant. Like you're looking for a good match, that person's out there or they're not. It's a little bit simpler formula. Right, right. So a couple of things that change with the job market thing that affect how long you're willing to, to chase your dream 
is those benefits and costs are also changing, right? So if we, let's stick with the minor league for a second. So making the minor leagues at 32 is going to have a smaller total payoff than making the minor leagues at 25, right? Like you just, you won't have as yep. many years, productive years in the league. And so the longer you continue your search, in some sense, the marginal benefit of actually getting what you want decreases over time. And on the flip side, your opportunity cost is probably increasing, right? So you mentioned, you know, you know, these days, a lot of baseball players do go to college. So you've got a degree in something, but you know, if you've been in the league, minor leagues for five years and you haven't been doing anything in the off season, you know, you haven't opened a spreadsheet in five years. You don't know what Slack is at all. You know, you're all that stuff you learned in college is starting to get a little old. I'll, I'll interject with a very brief uh, reassertion of what you just said. An acquaintance of mine that uh, from running track in college went to an, a rival university that we went to was a much more successful runner, went on to become a professional sponsored athlete, didn't make it to the Olympic or world championship level, which I think is what everybody's goal is, but made a decent uh, career, um, wasn't famous, but made some good money had the sponsor, got the prize money, got some bonuses, Uh, 35, 36, distance running is no longer an option for him. Has a finance degree from a D1, very reputable school. And I was having a conversation with him. I knew him uh, at this point in his life. And I said, well, he had a finance degree. That's great. And he's like, Brett, I don't know what's going on in finance right now. He's like, 10 years have passed. The markets are different. The style of work is different. The people have passed me. And I thought about it. And I, my first thought was, you're not valuing your education enough. And then the second thing I thought was like, you know, I think he's probably right. There's a lot of things that have happened in the world of finance between, uh, you know, the turn of the century and present day when we were having this conversation. Um, and he was satisfied with not being able to go into a finance career path. Um, and you know, I think you're exactly right. Like the, the window closed, he, he didn't quite make the successful journey that he wanted to, but he did make a pretty good living, Yep. but he's still got another career in front of him that he needs to figure out. Right. And it wasn't, it wasn't what he wanted. Yep. And so yeah, no, that's, that's a perfect example. And so, you know, relative to this really simple model that we talked about, I think the, the sort of minor league model, the, the chase your dream risky career model, right? Both of those things are going to make the search a little shorter, right? So like your costs are, every year, your costs are going up, the benefits are going down. So, you know, my, my guess is that your, your willingness to chase that dream, right, is probably a little shorter than if those things weren't true. Um, and so what, what a lot of the, what a lot of the models end up looking like in terms of like your optimal decision is to basically kind of draw a line in the sand and say, this is like my reservation value, right? So, um, in the minor league examples, like, look, I know at this point I can go back and use my finance degree, you know, maybe I can make 40,000 a year. And I tell myself that as long as I, I do my expected value calculation, as long as either my chance of making it to the majors is high enough or the contract that I would get is high enough that my expected value of that next year's contract is more than 40,000, then I'm going to keep it. I'm going to stay in the minor leagues. But as soon as that falls below it, either because like, I just don't think I could get the contract that's big enough, or maybe just my chances are getting a little smaller. Then once I drop below that reservation wage, then I probably ought to go back and start using my finance degree. And that gives kind of this rule of thumb that people can use. Um, And again, it's called like a reservation wage or reservation price. And that's what most of the optimal solutions end up looking like. So something that we've talked about uh, over our, over the course of our conversations, both uh, within this podcast and separately is there's a lot of uh, data collection. It's we're collecting data on how we spend, on how we save, on how we uh, educate, in some cases, our kids on money and things like that. Um, Something that I think, and and this is um, 
sincerely unique to the individual is there's an emotional attachment as a late teens, early twenties to, I can do this, I can make it. And you're not thinking so much about, um, maybe that cost, um, benefit price you're paying time analysis. How do you back up as a 20 year old, 22 year old and say, okay, I need to start recording my goals. I need to start recording my threshold, my pain threshold. Did I reach those goals? Did I miss any of them? Let's say I have 10 goals and I reached eight of them. Uh, do I keep going? Do I see if I can get those two back in the next year or the year after before it turns into Kevin Costner in his late thirties uh, and everyone feels sorry for him. Um, and, and you, and Kevin Costner feels sorry for himself. That's right. Um, it, it is hard. Um, I think there's, I think the data is one thing and then there's our, our interpretation of the data. Right. So my yeah. guess is, you know, if I talk to my nephew just graduated high school and wants to be a rock and roll star, like I can look in the, I, and the nice thing is that there's lots of data out there. Right. So, but I can look and I can say, you know, it looks like in terms of all music revenue in the entire music industry, you know, 99% of it goes to 0.1% of the people. Right. You know, and I can tell him that, but an 18 yeah. year old could easily come back to me and say, great, I'll just be one of those 0.1%, right. you know? <laughs> yeah. All right. Uh, so um, it, it is hard to separate. I think um, two, two pieces of advice. I think it is still, I mean, again, for me, for me, it would be worth it to get that data. Like at least at some point, kind of put it yourself in front of it and make yourself, how are you going to respond to it? Like make yourself respond to it. And again, that's way easier than it used to be. I mean, if, you know, there's Glassdoor, there's LinkedIn. There, there's lots yeah. of ways for people to find out what does a career path look like in this. And in fact, if we go back to the minor league example, oh my God, like baseball is statistics you know heaven for you know yeah. the, the whole thing is data right in baseball so exactly you know exactly. one yeah, is all you there know, is this data there's very little emotion <laughs> from an outsider's perspective it, it's all data you're absolutely right. right right so you know what like we like we talked about having you know the personal finance conversations with your partner like whatever it takes right like get yourself in a good mood pick a nice sunset you know nice little porch beer glass of wine but make yourself look at the data at some point. Um, I think the other thing that can help with that is to get, to have some advisors that, that are, you know, one step removed, maybe and obviously hopefully have a little bit more experience. So they've seen the data, they've seen, they've known people who have gone down these paths yeah. and have someone that'll be honest with you. I mean, as, as my job as a professor, I advise graduate students and, you know, we talk about like, look, do you want an academic job? Okay. Well, Here's, the, here's what the funnel looks like, right? This is how many people start a PhD program. Here's how many finish. Here's how many get an academic job, you know, and at least kind of, this is what it looks like for the typical person. You may not be typical, but I like to show them that, you know, just to, just to give a level playing field. And again, as someone who's advised a lot of students and have been through part of that process myself, I might be able to be a, be kind, but be a little more objective than the person who's just convinced they're, they're the next Nobel Prize winner. I think that's uh, incredibly thoughtful. I mean, the, the concept A of having a mentor or a uh, mentorship influence on you is, is super valuable, um, particularly in the context that you suggested. As a college professor, you're essentially a professional mentor and you get, you have to be unemotional about it. Right. My, uh, my dad was also a college professor that worked with PhD students, and he once shared with me uh, a soundbite that I thought fit immediately when you brought that up. You said, you earn a PhD, you don't get a PhD. So you don't enter a PhD program and say, okay, when I'm done, I get my PhD. You have to actually earn it. There are people that don't get it. There are people that, that don't complete the work, don't, uh, don't pass through that threshold and that could be that's exactly the same thing we're talking about with your nephew as a rock star with minor league baseball players you don't get to be a major league baseball player you don't get to be on stage with you two or chance the rapper or whomever uh is performing in front of 30 40 50 000 people you earn that right and having somebody uh with that outside objective 
uh, personal uh, influence on you. Um, that can give you a little bit of guidance is not a bad thing at all. And if you don't have that person, maybe that data can be that, right? You can step out of your own head for a moment and look at the data and say, if I'm going to be a major league baseball player, I have to, and, and let's say I'm a, uh, an outfielder, I have to have a batting average of X. Have I ever had a batting average of that? How right. close have I been to it? Is the pitching going to get better or is it going to get worse? Am I going to get better or am I going to get worse, right? You're going to have to earn that data, that, that, uh, that level. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll add another quote and, I, and, I'll, and I'll ask you for your reaction on it. So um, to play a little bit of devil's advocate, I, I saw an interview with Dave Chappelle uh, several years ago. I think it was on the Inside the Actors Studio. And he was talking about his entrance at a, at a young age into – uh, acting and comedy, and his dad was a, an, an, an educator, and he was discussing essentially this moment in time. Do I go into Hollywood? Do I try to make it? And his dad's giving him some good dad advice, and he, he turns to his dad and he says, well, look, dad, if, if, a, if a teacher or an educator makes Y salary a year, X salary a year, and I was able to make that much money as a comedian and an actor. Wouldn't that be making it? So even as a, is, is making it uh, fluid? Yeah, yeah. And no, is, uh, uh, is being, he was being Kevin Costner, a professional baseball player for 20 years, uh, in, in the example of Bull Durham, is that making it? Yeah, no, that, I mean, that's a good point. So, you know, the, the, the folks that, that want to chase dreams in these, in these kind of winner take all industries, right. Where huge payoffs to a few people, um, yeah. they may love what they're doing. And we've talked about an expected payout, but remember any given year, you're either in the majors or you're in the minors, right? There's no, I'm 90% major, 10% or, you know, 10% major, 90% right. minor. Any given year, you're only going to get one outcome or the other, right? So we're making decisions using an average, but your, your actual realized career path is just, is going to be one or the other. And it may be that someone who ends up with a long draw of, you know, I'm the, I'm the minor league player. I'm the, I'm the local bar band that, you know, plays three times a month, but only in my town that if you love what you're doing and you know, you're willing to take that hit knowing that, you know, however small a chance it is, it may turn around someday. Um, I can't as an economist say that that's not necessarily a good use of time. Um, the other, I, I think this is related the other um, thing that I didn't mention about the, the sort of optimal solutions to these kinds of problems is that even at best, you're only able to sort of maximize um, and like find the best outcome a small percent of the time, right? So even in that simple like sure. when to get off the yeah. dating app thing, right? you, you try out a hundred different people, the odds that even with the best strategy, the odds that you actually end up with the best match out of the hundred is only about a third of the time, right? So <laughs> the other two thirds of the time in someone's real life, they're going to yeah. end up with a partner that wasn't theoretically the best, but does that mean they're doomed to a, you know, unhappy marriage? No, <laughs> not necessarily, right? right? right. Um, and the same with the careers, right? So you may, you may go through a career and never make it to that top echelon, but that doesn't mean that you either made the wrong decisions or that you can't sort of psychologically come to terms with that and enjoy the process as it played out. So as your, as your role as a college professor advising PhD students or as your role as a parent or as a role as a uh, strong figure in your family, whether it's to your nephew or to uh, uh, another you know, your child or your child's friends or something where you can be this sounding board. Uh, what are the, what are a few bullet points of takeaways? Um, how, how do you summarize this concept that is clearly complicated, clearly has a, a significant portion out of the control of the, the user? How do you try to narrow it down to make it 
something manageable and something to follow. Yeah, I think I think ultimately what I'm trying to do in those conversations is um, to take something that's it's obviously very important. I mean, we're talking about you know your career, how you're going to spend the majority of your time for the next you know 20 to 40 years. So I I think what I'm trying to get to there is like, can we make a plan and right and can the plan be evidence based and you know logical at some level right now we can always pivot from that plan but yeah. let's make sure we understand again what the costs and benefits of our choices are right that if i'm going to spend a couple years gigging around the country i'm not going to college i'm not i'm yeah. not you know gaining that human capital and and just be upfront that like look that's something you're giving up right so clarify what the what the trade offs are come up with a plan to you know we talked about these kind of these demarcations, these kind of reservation wages, like at what point do I need to reassess? At what point do I need to potentially make a new decision? And you're not locked into that, but at least you're moving forward now and it's not all emotion driven. It's not all, you know, big eyes, pie in the sky. You're being yeah. realistic, but you're taking, and you're taking kind of, you know, you're taking a gamble that you've weighed the cost and benefits. And at that point, if they come back and say, yeah, I still want to do it, then, you know, I'll help them as best as much as I can. How important is the consistency and uh, efficiency of that review process as well? Yeah, that's a good point. So, I mean, I, I think that the informal examples, it's never that, you know, but like with my students, we have, um, we have a, like an individual development plan. We have kind of a department policy that at least once a year that I meet with each student, they, they're basically doing exactly, they're walking, they're writing down their goals. What did I, how did I improve this year? What do I need to improve on? Um, and so that is a, a formal process. Um, so required mm -hmm. at the University of North Carolina, you must sit down and have a very formal goal evaluation, goal setting, mentorship, moment yeah that's right and yeah. and you know again that's i right. that's excellent i to the extent that you can create something like that you know for big decisions in your own life um obviously it's not going to be that formal but if you can commit to something like that and get someone else to commit to it with you i think it would be helpful i don't disagree with that i think that i think that's sometimes you know we use the terms like living in the macro versus living in the micro uh and, or even just like living in that day-to-day -day moment of, uh, I had a great game today. I'm going to make it to the majors. Uh, I didn't have a good day today. I'll learn from it. I'll get better. I'll make it to the majors. But then to sit back at the end of the season and say, okay, what was my batting average? How many innings, how many outs did I get to play? Um, what, what uh, does the peer pool look like? If I'm going to be a rock star, how many nights did I get to perform? Uh, how many downloads did I get? How many listens did I get? Um, is that uh, in the bottom of the pool? Is that, am I comparing myself to the wrong people? Um, what would be my goal for the next step? You know, do I get a 10% increase in, in downloads? Do I get a 20% increase in downloads? Do I still enjoy doing what I'm doing while I'm trying to get more downloads or getting more <laughs> right. gigs? Um, I think that's really good. I think there's something to be said about um, having a formality to your process um, and not being afraid to be vulnerable with yourself and also being able to maybe communicate that with a an external person that might be your mentor, might be a parent, might be a sibling, might be a friend. Um, uh, I'll let you. I'll let you have the last word on this one because I think there's um, you. You and I have different uh, have come up in our careers in different ways, and uh, and that which is kind of the genesis of a lot of our conversations like this to begin with. But with respect to how things could go uh, differently or how things could be better managed, uh, I'll let you take the last word on this one. Ooh. Um, yeah, that's a big one. I mean, again, I'm, I'm trying to, for that one. <laughs> yeah, well, I'm, I'm trying to think about, you know, kind of what, what have I, what have I said in some of these conversations with people that I've mentored, um, people that are, or even like, what would I say to myself, you know, back at that point? Um, I, 
I know that I, so I can sleep at night. So if I've thought about doing something risky and I have, there's been a couple decisions I made in my life that would probably be considered that. Um, you've, you've had a couple career move, career pivots. Yeah. You've lived yeah. in different countries. Yes. Um, you've, you've made commitments to uh, a career path at a young age. Yep. Yep. And you've, and I, you've put the stake in the ground a few times and and it's, and it's paid forward. Right. Right. Um, but I think, I think what helps me, like when I finally get to a point in those decisions where I'm like, okay, like I'm comfortable with the decision I made. It's usually after I've gone through some sort of process, whether it's a, a pro con list or, you know, where I, yeah. like I've said earlier, like I've tried to be very explicit about what do I think, I can gain and what can I lose under this decision and of the decisions in front of me, I think on average, this one looks the best. I know it may not work out that way. And I know I may have to, to pivot or figure some way to, you know, deal with the disappointment in that path. But all the information I have right now, I think this is the best way forward. And um, knowing that, you know, what happens happens in the future that I may or may not have control over. But when I think about those big decisions is when I've, I've finally been comfortable when I've been able to kind of say something along those lines. Like, I know it may not work out, but I do think kind of everything taken into account, I think this is a path that's going to lead to sort of a better chance of success. Um, and so far in my life, I've, most of those draws have been positive. So <laughs> <laughs> I'd say that's fair. Awesome. That was great. I really appreciate the, the, the thoughtfulness and the, the candor. Um, it's a, it's as a parent and as a, an individual navigating a career and a life path, uh, it's very easy to get caught up in the moment. So to be able to sit back and say like, you know what, let's do this. Let's write things down. Let's reassess. Let's check in with people that don't have an emotional engagement to us uh, or to this process. Let's make sure that we're making the moves in the right direction and let's not be afraid to get out when it's the right time to get out let's be instead of quitting becoming a major league baseball player and thinking that as a negative maybe we think of it as uh, pivoting in a career that you're more suited for you will be more successful at you might be ha you will be happier at you'll you'll have a longer opportunity and things like that and um, so I, I appreciate that that input we'll put some of this um, some of your methods together on the website so that there can be a little bit of a guideline, a little bit of a North Star. I think at the end of the day, everything that we talk about is very malleable um, and has to be taken into consideration by the user and not so much like Trog said X, I must do X. It's like Trog gave us a couple of goalposts. He gave us a couple of sidelines. Let's see where that takes us um, and, and use your best judgment. And, and at the end of the day, use what makes you happy and makes future you happy as well. Right. Exactly. Cool, man. This was great. Thank you so much. I, uh, like I said, I appreciate all the input and I look forward to another conversation soon. All right. Thanks, Brett.